I have had a bit of an <coughs> odd background that's brought me here. So I did work in consulting, civil engineering as a geotech for five years before moving to academia. I studied computer science as well, and I'm currently also a research fellow in the math department at Warwick University. So a big mix there. And uh, I did also have to provide a plug for my PI's project, this ERC Singularity project, which is at the uh, mostly based at Warwick in here. But uh, so Wazy asked me to give some background on anomaly detection techniques and where, how machine learning is related to this area, and in particular with a focus on infrastructure. And before getting into that, I thought I'd just mention some major technology trends that we're seeing. And of course, we've seen some of that in the previous talk. Uh, but in terms of monitoring and infrastructure, we're seeing an increased volume of data. Sensors are better, they're faster, and all of this. But also the consequences of severe failures are increasing. So the just-in-time economy, uh, population densities are going up and so on, things move faster. So we're in a, a risk environment that's moving very fast, but failures are not tolerated in the in infrastructure world. So in particular, as a civil engineer, it's very bad for your career if a bridge collapses or something like this. Uh, on the other hand, in machine learning traditionally, uh, we're in a quite a different uh, risk environment where any gain that can be found out of data is useful and risks, uh, uh, failures are tolerated. So this would be something like a recommender system that says, well, you enjoyed this book, you might like this one. If someone doesn't buy the book, your company doesn't fold. Okay, so it's quite different and we've seen some big advances in this area. So deep neural networks have been a big gain in terms of our ability to use certain algorithms in an efficient way. But the challenge is really to bridge this gap and, and how do we manage risk and leverage these new techniques and so on. Okay. So combining in this talk machine learning and anomaly detection, and this is background really, but with some of the new techniques interspersed throughout. And machine learning is a kind of buzzwordy name. It's popular at the moment, but this popularity waxes and wanes. Uh, other names that you may have heard over the years, data mining, predictive analytics, narrow artificial intelligence, but it's statistics, numerical methods applied to data. And anomaly detection, there's some philosophical problems in how you define what an anomaly is, but the introductory definition is detection of outlier events or observations detecting deviations from the expected pattern of a data set. So things I'll cover, uh, just some background on time series analysis and anomaly detection, and then some examples throughout the talk and how this relates to machine learning. Okay, so traditional decomposition of a time series would look something like this. We start off with, I'll use this board actually, some observed data set, and of course everything's very nice here. We see all the data, there's no gaps in it or anything like that. And then we extract out a trend and some repeated fluctuation which we'll call a seasonal component, and then anything left over is what we call the random component. So this is what's been done for a very long time, and there's a variety of variations on this theme, and what we're seeing now is ways to get around some of these aspects or improve our ability to do this sort of decomposition. Now, types of anomalies are usually classified in the following way. First of all, point anomalies, so these uh, observations that deviate from the trend, so in this case, uh, these are sunspot data. The stationary standard deviation provides an indicator as what counts as a usual data point. Okay, so it's the individual data point that matters. We also have contextual anomalies. So in this case, the monthly temperature is shown. And here, although T1 and T2 both have the same value of temperature, December, a low temperature is okay in June, this is anomalous, okay. And finally, collective anomalies, each individual data point is not anomalous on its own, but with reference to the entire data set, we see that this is something odd here. So if this is heartbeat data, we've, we've skipped a beat. Okay. And since this is our, you know, the new big thing that's in the media so much, I give some very quick background on deep neural networks, um, this is what I work in as well. And the idea has been around for 
I think the 50s they first built um, a physical sort of neural network model. And the old style neural networks have an input and an output layer and some form of nonlinearity in between. And a deep neural network is a number of nonlinearities stacked on top of each other. And this has some computational benefits, but it's really, it's not magic once you get into it, although it can seem that way if you don't engage with the mathematical literature. What we're able to do with these is approximate functions. And if you think, if we're analyzing time series, this can be useful. Okay, if we've got an ability to, to look at the data and piece it apart in a clever way. So, I've got two styles of explanation here. If you like math, this is what's happening. And if you don't, that's here. So I wasn't quite clear who my audience was going to be. So <laughs> the idea is that we've got some inputs and outputs and there's a space of allowable functions, which is adjustable. And we define what's meant by a good function in terms of some error thing, okay? An error functional or loss function. These have various names and this defines a landscape and you try to walk the error down to the lowest value you can find. The next part of the challenge is to find ways to adapt this to the problem that you have. Okay, and we'll see some examples of that. There's also my diagrammatic version of training a neural network to dispel the magic. Uh, you have these levers, that's the adjustment, input and output data, that's your error function. You train the network by adjusting the levers until you get a green light. That's all it is. So what that does enable us to do, though, is build a hierarchical, in deep neural networks at least, a hierarchical classification of the data. So in terms of classifying this picture as a car, and I stole this from uh, Facebook's head of AI because it's a good slide, we have at the first la layer of the neural network features like edges or color gradients. The next level up, we start seeing things like maybe a headlight or something like this. And by the time we get up here, we see distinctly wheels and, and other things like this. And this has been, this does somewhat match what happens in a human visual cortex. You do uh, have neurons that recognize specific faces and so on. And again, the challenge is how do we use this for anomaly detection? Okay, so still on background, problem categories in machine learning. Um, Supervised and unsupervised learning. So we have typically observations and in some cases labels. And we need a way to map between those. Supervised learning is just that. Learn the probability of some output given an input. Unsupervised learning is what is the probability distribution that fits this data. Then semi-supervised is trying to leverage advantages of both. And reinforcement learning, which if you've seen AlphaGo or AlphaZero, these things, that's those sort of techniques, uh, won't talk about that today, it's sort of a totally different area. So how can we use this? First we'll go over uh, supervised learning for anomaly detection. And the idea is that given data labels, so given a set of data, time series, and a data set or something like this, and a set of labels that say this is okay or this is not okay, we wanna use a pattern matching algorithm to then observe future data sets and decide whether or not it's anomalous or not anomalous. Now, where do we get this data from? It can be from observations. It can be from models or simulations and so on. Talk about that briefly in a moment. And then we can use this simulated data as a proxy to train our models. So you kind of have two phases with these algorithms training where you're adjusting your model to fit the data set, and then a monitoring phase where you let it loose and you no longer have labels and you just build predictions. Okay, there's a variety of ways of doing this. So um, simple methods like linear regression, deep neural networks, or Gaussian processes as well, which is a sort of uh, non-parametric way of doing this. And the advantages of something like this is you gain an uncertainty of you gain a measure of the uncertainty of your estimate away from your data point. So here, these gray bars are showing the error in the estimate, and near the data points, the black dots, the blue line is well fitted. So uh, this can also be approximated for very large data sets using some more advanced techniques. 
but we might not have many observations. So in the case of uh, mobile networks or something like this, you have a lot of data and maybe you want to project forward in time so you can use traditional methods like ARMA, family of models, where you're assuming that the next uh, points in the time series depend on the recent past. And of course, there's a, there's a whole family of these like ARIMA and GARCH and all of these sorts of things. Uh, recurrent neural networks are a more modern way of doing this, but I won't go into detail. <coughs> of course, uh, my background's really in uncertainty quantification for civil engineering problems. And in these, we build a physical model and use that as our way to extrapolate into the future. So this is a sort of different problem domain from a set network with incoming data. We're trying to figure out what we think this thing's going to do beforehand. Of course, we can collect all this data, train a supervised model on this. Okay. There's also unsupervised learning. So in this case, we're not trying to append labels onto the data. We're just looking at the data itself and trying to work out what it tells us. This is good in that it avoids the need for labeled anomalies, but it can have bizarre behavior of its own. So this can be difficult as well. Now, the overall idea is to find compressed representations of data, and then anything that doesn't fit the compressed model is counted as an anomaly, okay? And there's a variety of names here of different methods you may, may not be familiar with, so k-means clustering, PCA, uh, support vector machines, and so on. So auto-encoded deep neural networks I'll cover briefly in this as well. Traditional clustering type uh, anomaly detection is like this. So we group the data into clusters and anything that doesn't fit the cluster is an anomaly or an outlier. But this is fraught with huge problems. It seems nice here, but it's actually really difficult. And there's a million families of different clustering methods that work well for different data sets or not. So each row here is a different data set and each column's a, a clustering method. And I actually cut this down from a much larger picture and we see that some of them have good performance or not, or what do you mean by a cluster or what don't you? So up here, we've split these two concentric circles into different clusters indicated by the coloring, but uh, here we've split them this way, and that might actually be what you want. So it's, it's a challenge. Although there is out-of-the-box methods for simple tasks, when you've got real problems, it, it becomes tricky. Okay, so just to extend this to time series type analysis, this is a sort of more traditional approach. You take your time series and rather than split it beforehand into a trend and a seasonal component, you use a sliding window of what size, hard to pick, but it's part of the game, to find short time features in the data and then you cluster these. Then when you have a signal, when you're doing the actual processing part, you find the closest cluster, subtract away the cluster from the signal and anything left over is an anomaly. Sounds nice, hard to actually use. What is the problem with uh, uh, removing a repeated pattern uh, uh, by uh, <coughs> applying with Fourier analysis and... Uh... You can do, you, there's spectral clustering methods use a SVD or Fourier type approach. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's, depends on your data set, okay? So here's just an example, uh, circa 2010, UK National Grid, two large transformers, um, variety of sensors, about roughly 25 on each of these two aging transformers, an attempt to detect uh, anomalous behavior. And they used a, a Gaussian mixture model clustering, which is uh, the cluster centers are the means of Gaussians and that you try to fit the covariance matrices of these. And uh, as I just put this in here, I wasn't gonna talk about it very much, but the previous talk highlighted very well uh, the difficulties of actually collecting this data and what you do with it and the, the processing frameworks really matter for large infrastructure and so on. Okay, and the, interestingly in this paper, they detected, I think, 21 false negatives. False negatives? Well, they, their alarm went off 21 times and each time they could have ignored it. Okay, so, so they spent a lot of money and they did all this stuff and they, 
didn't really detect anything they needed to detect. So you can use all these methods, but it's not so easy. False positives, I should have said. OK, so a more modern way of doing this, rather than using a, a traditional clustering method, is to use a deep neural network. And in this case, the loss function is trying to reconstruct the data after passing through this information bottleneck. And what's the advantage of something like this? Well, it's computationally very efficient and it can model very large nonlinearities. So you're not putting assumptions into your data, uh, model dependent assumptions into your data. So in the initial phase, you train the network to reconstruct the data that you do have. And then, because you've compressed the data, you've cut away some of the features, when you have a new observation, you pass it through this autoencoder and the reconstruction error tells you how hard it was to fit into the model, which is an indicator that a data point may be anomalous if it's very hard to fit into the previous model. And again, we can learn those sort of complicated features I showed before, which is nice, but it doesn't solve all of our problems. So just to talk about um, challenges and, and risks and so on in, in more traditional fields, so again, I have a civil engineering background. Uh, we have heterogeneous data, it's high dimensional, it's spatially and temporally variable. It's very difficult to propose a general solution, so this is always an adaptive process and, and reactive in some way, because there's always going to be failure events we didn't account for beforehand, otherwise most of us would be out of a job, I imagine. Data quality is often poor, in particular if you're working, so I was a tunneling engineer, uh, a lot of old infrastructure, you know, there's handwritten reports and so on, and, and how do you work with that with these sort of methods? It's quite a challenge, or technician reports of plant failure and things like this. Um, Non-stationary data sets make telling anomalies apart from just a trend very difficult, and large projects have a large computational overhead as you heard previously. And I see that there's kind of two modes that we're in, in dealing with uh, sensor networks and so on. So in one case, we have a lot of components that are interlinked, and each of these components may be replicated a number of times. So in this case, a, a road monitoring network, you may roll out a very large number of these CCTV cameras or other detection systems. And this is in contrast to something like a tunnel, so we've got a laser uh, point cloud scan here of a tunnel, this is sort of a one-shot project. And it's, it requires different, a different approach to the data and so on, and, and the custody of the data and how you think about what an anomaly is because you're working with it in different ways. So in this case, you're usually working more with a physical model and comparing the data to that, which has its own challenges. As a... Uh, Exemplar application of what something we can look to, I think, at the moment, IT infrastructure security, this is moving very fast. Uh, what they're doing is monitoring servers, routers, and so on for uh, intrusions. This is quite interesting mentioning uh, in the previous talk, you should you know, consider your opponent some sort of Machiavellian bad guy after you. Well, this is kind of what they do here. Uh, they assume that there's intrusions that are trying to hide themselves and act as if they're part of the network, and they're seeing some, some big successes. Part of this is that their infrastructure for collecting data is very good because it's computerized, it was built recently compar compared to some tunnel from 100 years ago and so on. Uh, there's a willingness to adapt to new technologies, that's their space, and because everything moves at such a high speed, the data volumes are so huge, humans are less useful. So you're forced into that, that regime. And of course, this is the case for anything large like the 4G network or so on. So I think this is something as well that we can uh, look to for other infrastructure areas and, and pull something away from that. Of course, if we do extend into this sort of smart cities idea everyone goes on about, everything's interlinked, we're going to have to improve our data collection abilities to match what can be done in some of those areas. And uh, humans are slow and make mistakes, and so it would be nice to have a magical solution that didn't make those mistakes, but that's, of course, very, very hard. And uh, just very briefly, the project I'm engaged with here at the Turing, uh, 
it's a bit of a mouthful estimating system health from streaming sensor data. But the idea is that uh, as well as detecting anomalies, we also classify the types of failures, do predictive analytics, and try to figure out maintenance schedules and things like this. So uh, this is interdisciplinary work, and I think this is going to be the trend in all of these areas that we're going to have to put our heads together and find a way to move forward together. So just to conclude, I've just given some background. Um, and like I mentioned at the start, we've got these new machine learning techniques that are very powerful. And so here's a, a nice example, not from anomaly detection, but just a general machine learning paper. What they're doing is inputting a description of some text. And they have some neural networks which generate images from that text. So the middle row is it's a two-stage image generation process. What's important is here, and this is really quite impressive. I mean, people's enthusiasm for this is starting to wane. We're seeing lots of these, but a few years ago, this was very cool. But what's interesting here is that, you know, this is really good, but this bird on the end kind of has two heads. So a database method, although it can produce very cool results, has a different way of failing than what a human would observing the data. So if we do try to scale up and uh, use these automated methods on our data, we're going to have to be careful to look out for two-headed birds, as it were. Okay. Thank you. 